Verbier. One of the world's most renowned off-piste destinations, and for the last two and a half decades, it has played host to the legendary final of the Freeride World Tour. The intimidatingly steep and jagged 600-metre rock face of the Bec de Ross has challenged the world's best to conquer it. It's a unique event because there's no face like that. It's the biggest, burliest face in the world that you'll ever have a free ride comp on. Um, the whole atmosphere is pretty magical itself. Just like so nervous up being up there and it's wind and it's cold because you did that two hour hike, you've been stressed for the whole morning, probably didn't sleep the night before. Each year it was always the same terror. I always have the same terror when I go there. One misstep during a run could be the difference between walking away or flying away in a helicopter, so not that fun. And suddenly we're looking up and it comes just a big snow cloud through the rocks. We just, whoa, avalanche! I think the extreme of Verbier is the birth of competition of freeride. It's super steep. There are so many lines and big cliffs. This is free riding. Bec for me is scary, amazing and beautiful. This is what we have been working for the whole season. Yeah. Qualify for the grand finale here in Verbier skiing the Bec de Ross, which is a serious face. The Bec de Ross is unique in free riding. It has a huge face, starting at 3,223 meters and finishing at 2,600 meters, meaning a huge vertical drop of 600 meters that leaves even the fittest athletes exhausted by the time they cross the finish line. The Bec is seriously steep, averaging 45 degrees and maxing out at 55 degrees. The face is littered with rocks, cliffs and dead-end shoots, making the descent a confusing and dangerous maze of options for the riders. Add to this that there's no practice run down the face and that line choice is based only on observation, which is even harder from 1.5 kilometers away. The biggest challenges of the back is the, the top is just unbelievably steep. You know, you're dragging your arms, it's so steep. And then there's no landmarks, there's no trees, it's just all rock on a big open face. So to find your way down that and find your way with speed and fluidity is an incredible mental challenge. It takes so much experience to be able to figure out how to get down it safely. To help them figure out their line choice, riders break the face down into a series of zones and features. The first zone is the central couloir, which features two main lines, one on the right down the middle, which culminates in the Hollywood cliff, and another variation which ends in the Gilles Voirol cliff, both of which appeal to riders looking to take a technical and spectacular line. The next main zone of the Beck is the dogleg couloir, appealing to riders looking for a faster, more fluid line with options for drops. Further options branch off to the rider's right-hand side. The third zone, the so-called heart zone, demands plenty of concentration and focus. The face also has numerous cliffs, features and entry points, all of which a rider can weave into their run and use to help navigate their way safely down the face. It's a fine mix for these athletes to push themselves to their limits, but not too much because consequences exist. If you push too much, the consequences can be quite severe. So, I mean, they train all year and only the best come here to Verbier. As the Verbier Extreme developed, so did the sport of free riding, bringing a new level of professionalism to the way it was judged. Unlike other alpine sports, free riding is not a race and is not about timing. Instead, riders are judged by a group of highly trained individuals, all of whom have expertise in free riding themselves and who mark the run from one to a hundred using several criteria. One criteria the judges look for is line choice. Whether the rider took a challenging technical line and made use of all of the terrain or if they just charge straight down to the finish. Fluidity of the run is also key. The next criteria is air and style. Here, the judges are looking at the number and critically the size of the jumps, plus the rider's control in the air. The judges also ask, was the jump stylish? And did the rider make a smooth landing? Or did they discover a new terrain feature on the mountain? Control is the strictest criteria because it directly affects rider safety. A controlled run down the mountain scores highly, whereas a wild seat of your pants run littered with mistakes is heavily docked. 
Technique is the last of the criteria, rewarding riders who make confident turns down the face and avoid getting flushed down the hill. It was 1994. The very, very extreme concept started with the film production on the Bec Ross of a surfing and snowboarding movie for the Swiss surfing team. Uh, we set a long lens camera and rode the Bec Ross and spontaneously dozens of spectators just stopped there and watched. First edition of the Very Extreme in 1996 um, was particular because we had no experience of organizing an event. We didn't know if it was going to work. And the snow conditions were really quite under average. So we asked Dedeheim and Jérôme Ruby to come and test the face two weeks before the event. And um, I remember them hopping in the helicopter, riding this face in sugary, really bad snow and arriving down in the finish area and saying, fine, it's going to work. And it was really good because it gave us this confidence to continue and believe in the project. That year was the French rider Jerome Ruby in hard boots and riding with a classic Alpine style, who laid down a fearless line to take third. Going straight down from the start gate and then skimming the borders of the closed section, he was probably the first person ever to set foot on that part of the mountain. But it was the West Coast surf style of California's Steve Klassen that would win the day. He thrilled the judges and the watching crowds with a smooth, stylish line that seemed to defy the gradient of the beck. With that inspired run, in front of a huge crowd, Steve Klassen took first place. And with that, big mountain riding started to come of age. Yeah, Klassen's full legend. He's been doing this uh, since I was like, you know, four years old, <laughs> riding down this mountain. Like one of the first guys to ride down it, uh, holds the most wins on the back. I think it's five wins and he's ridden it numerous times, I don't know. The most psyched to ride this face out of anybody. The reaction of the crowd on this first day was um, unbelievable. And uh, that made us all feel that uh, there was something special there. And from core media to mass media, those pictures were on the eight o'clock news. People felt that uh, it was very special. The 2003 edition followed a winter of poor snow conditions, which left the Beck almost unrideable. With safety paramount, it was put to the vote whether or not to run the contest. Only one rider still wanted to compete. Steve Klassen was the only rider to vote against that decision. Uh, he wanted to ride the Beck de Ross in full competition mode that year. We didn't have the competition, the Beck was in terrible conditions, and he jumped the Hollywood cliff across. It took him like 100 meters to break. He actually didn't finish breaking. He had to point it to the next cliff, made it, went for another 720 off the, off the hip further down, and we were like, wow, Steve, we said there was no competition, but just to show, and we pulled that run. It was amazing. At this time, it wasn't just men riding the back. Right from the start, women had also been competing with riders like Julie Zell, Laurie Gibb, and Eva Sandelgaard dominating the first few events. I remember so clearly when I came the first year to Verbia and Beck de Ross, I was really scared of that Beck de Ross face, just rocks and stones all over. I remember that I clearly wanted to go home, but then, I mean, it was too late. I, I was there and I had to do it. Eva Sandelgaard continued to lay down impressive runs in the years that followed, winning in 1998, 99 and 2000. 2002 marked a changing of the guard as a new generation of young riders like Ruth Lacey-Back and Geraldine Fashnack emerged onto the scene. All that I had wanted in my life was to be invited once to take part in the Verbier Extreme to ride the Beg de Ross with the world's best snowboarders. After her first win, Fashnack continued to compete every year in the Verbier Extreme enjoying great rivalries along the way with American Julie Larson and her childhood friend Ruth Laceyback, who would also make her name on the Beck, winning five Verbier Extreme titles. Fashnack would go on to win once more on the Beck in 2009, before retiring from the competition in 2010 to focus on her own expeditions and on coaching the next generation of female freeriders. 
In 2004, skiers were finally invited to compete at the Verbier Extreme. No more forerunning or demonstrations. It was time to show the world what big mountain skiers could do on this legendary face. This year, in the ninth edition of the event, and for the first time ever in the contest, 10 skiers will also be descending in the daunting face of the Beck. 2005 was also the year that Seb Michaud won on the Beck. A convert from mogul skiing, Michaud put his acrobatic skills to breathtaking use, inspiring generations of skiers to come. Ever the showman, Seb Michaud came back in 2006 and sacrificed a win for one of the most impressive drops ever seen on this mountain. To my eyes, the most memorable sequence of Seb Michaud was the year he jumped that, I don't know, 25 meter long backflip down the back. I was already on the jump. I'd been concentrating only on the jump the whole time. And when I saw that, I said, OK, cool, no worries. The rocks don't bother me. And I sent it. Two thousand and eight marked the start of the Freeride World Tour, with the Verbier Extreme becoming the final of this four-stop tour. With the event now being beamed live to a global audience, there was even more pressure on the organisers to pick the perfect conditions to run the event. During the whole winter, we monitor the face. Uh, we go in the face. We cut the snow to see how the layers are stable, so that the avalanche danger is close to zero. But conditions change fast in the mountains, and despite all of the precautions, even the best laid plans come undone. And so, in 2008, with the final of the new Freeride World Tour only days away, Mother Nature called the shots once again. We were on the mountain with uh, the head guide, Claude Alain, uh, on the Thursday. We knew it was sketchy, but we had hopes that this last layer of snow would consolidate with the changes of temperatures and um, Claude Alain just moved a, a little stone out of the way very high on the mountain and that triggered the avalanche. Oh, no! And then I look up and it literally was like a billowing wave. I just see this massive amount of snow coming down on us. And I realize that I think I'm gonna be all right and I kind of look to my left and I look where Kai is and Kai's right in the middle of it. And I was just like, oh no, Kai, no. Oh. Look at the people, look at the people. I got super scared and turned around, skied away, but I traversing out from that avalanche. And then in the next shoot over came an even bigger avalanche from that too. And I come racing down towards that and all of a sudden just right around this little rock and I, I see him and I was just, oh my God, I can't believe he's there. I, I was almost guaranteed that he was gonna be 20 feet deep and it was gonna be a body recovery situation. I was just so happy to see him, you know, we just hugged and hugged. Two best friends who always stayed together, even sharing their hotel room in Verbier, became the greatest rivals of the Beck, Kai Zakrikson and Aurelien Ducrow. I was so happy when they announced me and Aurelien up on the podium. The winner together, it was that's a great feeling. It was perfect. It was a big moment for me because it was my first big victory. And also because I shared it with Kai. Their rivalry over the next few years was instrumental in pushing the boundaries of skiing on the Beck. As they tried to outdo each other with bigger cliffs and faster lines, both riders would raise their game, alternating wins and podium places. Then in 2010, with epic snow conditions on the Beck and both skiers at the peak of their powers, the two men would face off one last time in a classic showdown. With both of them having skied the same line and the same cliffs with near identical speed and fluidity, it was once again nearly impossible to separate the two men. After a long and anxious wait, the result was announced. Hey, 2010 was also a key year for progression in snowboarding, as French rider Xavier Delarue took a line at the Verbier Extreme that would redefine big mountain snowboarding on the Beck forever. 
According to the rules, De La Rue had no obligation to complete after the final had been cancelled. As the tour leader, he would now automatically be crowned tour champion. It was deemed his call as to whether he wanted to gamble everything on a rerun of the event or take the title by default. I'd noticed this line whilst I was skiing with my daughter. I was skiing in front of the Beck when I looked at it from a different angle, and I said to myself, there's a new line there for sure. It would need to be good conditions, but I was really motivated to open up a new line on the Beck. Xavier could have said, that's it, we don't rerun, and he was world champion, but no, he said, I want to rerun, and he did that line and won the world tour. The growth of the Freeride World Tour saw a new qualifying series spring up, with the top riders each year graduating onto the main tour. This system would produce a new generation of freeriders that were highly skilled and highly competitive on the Beck, none more so than Sweden's Rene Barkred. Coming into the Freeride World Tour in 2009, I, uh, before that season I was just super nervous. I go out of that start gate and get 10 meters fall, got hung upside down in a bush. First thought was, maybe the judges couldn't see that, but realized I was still hanging there, so. Definitely blew my confidence on that. I felt like I made a fool out of myself and just thinking, I, I have no business being here. After that initial failure in 2009, Barkrid skiing went from strength to strength. And by 2011, he was competing for the World Tour title in the final on the Bec de Ross. In 2012, Barkrid came into the Verbier Extreme with only an outside chance of winning the Tour title. New Zealander Sam Smoothie, with several podiums under his belt, and the USA's Drew Tabke were both in much stronger positions to win. Opting once again for the dogleg call while Barker dropped into the face and straight away sent it on a huge cliff before laying down a super fast, clean run to the bottom in a near perfect display of free riding. I was sitting in the in the hot seat at the bottom. As bib number three, it was 20 plus riders behind me, and every single one of them have the ability to beat me. Oh, that was an emotional roller coaster that whole day sitting down there. When it was all done and I had won, I I couldn't believe it. That was just a mess. It's just crazy. It all worked out today. It was a long shot, but it worked. René Barkrid made it, winning both the Extreme Verbier and the Freeride World Tour in 2012. And he did it again in 2017. It was René Barkrid who threaded a stunningly fast line through some of the biggest features on the face with his renowned control and mastery of landings. And yet, despite this being his 12th year on tour, he's far from retiring. Instead, he's very much in contention for the win here in Verbier on its 25th anniversary. In 2017, another rider impressed on the Beck. It was Leo Slemet who stomped a huge 360 at the top of the run and showed an impressive line which saw him claim second place in Verbier and secure the 2017 world title. Sadly, there is also a dark side of the sport. The Freeride World Tour community suffered two painful losses at the end of the 2016 winter. Estelle Ballet and Matilda Rappaport tragically passed away while practicing their biggest passion. The two-time world champion, Estelle Ballet, always inspired her peers with her grace, style and positive attitude. She died in an avalanche in the Valais region of Switzerland while shooting for a film. Only a few months later, a second shockwave rocked the freeride community. Swedish skier Matilda Rappaport passed away in an avalanche while shooting in Chile. Matilda was considered one of the best freeride skiers of her generation but it was her calm, open and friendly character that saw her become a role model for so many. She won the Verbier Extreme in 2013. Both are sorely missed. In 2017, 
every single rider rode for Estelle Ballet and Matilda Rappaport. Sammy Lubke is another rider who's written his name into the Beck de Rossi's history. Winning the Freeride World Tour three times in a row, Lubke dominated the Extreme Verbier in 2016, 17 and 18, and a second place in 2019. Using the Beck as his canvas, Lubke drew huge lines that saw him develop into one of the world's most well-rounded and stylish free riders. It's definitely everybody's dream to stay on top of the podium here in Verbier. It's the oldest extreme contest running and that's where it all started. Winner in 2019 was American Jonathan Penfield, who set the category on fire with a dazzling show of big mountain snowboarding. He linked together a series of huge airs, including a backside three. I'm really stoked to have laid down a run I'm happy with and have taken first place. Exceptional talent Victor Dillaru claimed his maiden freeride world tour victory in his rookie year with a third place in Verbier. Following in the footsteps of his older brother Xavier, Victor impressed the judges with a mix of big airs and fluid snowboarding. There is undoubtedly a dynasty in the making for the Delarues. With the 2019 Freeride World Tour title already secured, French snowboarder Marion Herty came to Verbier hungry to take home the extreme crown. And she put down the run of her life. I'm feeling the love for my sport right now, the love for snowboarding. This board, this thing right here, is what I live for. Ariana Tricomi entered the Extreme Verbier in 2016 with lots of crashes and a fifth place at the back. In the following year, she showed consistency and claimed a solid fourth. In 2018, the Italian nailed her line for her first extreme Verbier victory. Stylish airs and decisive big mountain riding. At the third time of asking, the Italian style queen looked at ease on the Bec de Ross. Tricomi became the 2018 Extreme Verbier winner and the new world champion of the Freeride World Tour. This is the most unbelievably successful day in my freeride career, if you want to call it that, to win the overall title and here on the Beck at the same time. One year later, in 2019, it was the local girl Elizabeth Gerritsen who blasted through the technical top section of the Beck de Ross and then followed that with big, confident airs and a far, strong line to take the extreme Verbier title on home snow. She was joined on the podium by defending champion Ariana Tricomi in second and Hazel Birnbaum in third. I just won the Extreme Verbier and this is my first victory on the Freeride World Tour in my home town with all my family and my friends on site. This is pretty much my childhood dream. I am so happy. World champion Christopher Turdell could not ride the face in 2018, but in 2019, Turdell returned with a decent third place on the Beck. He showed his signature high-speed drops and fast, silky turns. Not too bad, I would say. I'm super happy. Marcus Eder had a choice. He could play it safe to secure his world title, or he could risk it all with a big line in search of glory. Eder rolled the dice. Smooth skiing with a solid 360 and an impressive backflip. With sixth place in Verbier, he became the 2019 Freeride World Tour champion. Finally, it was Vardek Gorak who took the Verbier crown. 
In 2019, he celebrated his first win of the Extreme Verbier. I still don't realise what is happening to me right now. Not at all, actually. It's simply magical. A childhood dream that rarely happens. So I think I'm going to cry soon here. Simply magic. Everybody rode like crazy today. We had an incredible showdown here. Congratulations to everyone. And I hope we'll all have a good time next year. Now it's 2020 and uh, we've seen the evolution of skiing going down. Uh, in Extreme Verbien on the Vector Ross over the years. We went from really extreme skiing, billy goading, stepping on rocks, like get into the gnarliest area, to start riding a little bit faster, a little bit more flow and control, but still in the gnarly areas. And people start sticking their really big tricks on that mountain. It has been a long, long progressive curve, and without it, free riding wouldn't be where it is today.